Druidism was the religion of the Celtic people which was administered by priests and priestesses called Druids. Remnants of Druidism still presently exists. The Druids were a priestly caste existing among the Celtic people. The Celts, as they were called, were a tribal people who spread throughout Gaul, Britain, Ireland, other parts of Europe, Asia Minor and the Balkans. This migration had occurred in the 5th century BC. By the 1st century AD, the Roman had launched many attacks against the Celts, which greatly dwindled their population. Christianity dealt them their final defeat. There is little first-hand knowledge or the Druids of the Druids or of their religion. The chief reason for this is that they taught their acolytes secret Druidic druidical knowledge by word of mouth. None of this trusted knowledge was committed to writing. It was all learned through mnemonics. The most important knowledge that exists of the Druids comes from the writings of Julius Caesar. Caesar was not only a warrior and statesman, but a priest as well. Therefore, he was keenly interested in the Druidism and the Celtic people. Moreover, he was friendly with the pro-Roman Druid Divicius. Divicius, who shared with him many Druid beliefs, especially about their gods and their and life after death. Caesar mentions some of these beliefs and the behavior of the people in his Gaultic Wars. Gaultic Wars. The Gauls, he observed, treated their ordinary people almost like slaves. There were two notable classes among them, the Druids and the Knights. The Druids were concerned with the divine worship. They officiated over both public and private sacrifices. They interpreted the ritual questions, settled disputes and issued punishments to those refusing to obey their ruling. Caesar asserted several times that Druid power originated in Britain and that Britain remained the center of Druidism. This judgment of the Druids was profound and also served to unite the Celtic people. Druidic decisions were critical and were to be completed, completely adhered to. Caesar noted those not obeying the decisions were banished from the tribe and even a wider community. In Gaul, there were always boundary disputes which required Druidic intervention. The suggestion that the Druids settled boundaries disputes indicates the importance of Druidic rule among the Celtic tribes. More evidence that the Druids and the religion of Druidism held the Celts together was the tribal assemblies which occurred on days that were vital in the agricultural year. The original Druidic festive days were Baltan? Beltan? Beltan? May 1st. The beginning of summer Lothnasa? Loth Nasa. August August first, uh, the beginning of autumn, and summer. Summer. November first, the beginning of winter. 
The assemblies, especially large and important ones, took place in sanctified places. It was here that people from a large area or a whole island would gather, for example, ancient uh, would gather. For example, ancient Ireland was divided into five communities, each separate and independent of each other, but all unified on days of great feasts. Both on the continent and in Ireland uh, both on the continent and in Ireland, the Druids held themselves above the kings, unless they held both offices. They held themselves in very high esteem, which was shared for, for them by the people. The Druids called themselves creators of the universe. In Ireland, kings were nowhere without Druids to advertise them, uh, advise them. The Druids believed they were the incarnations of the gods. What were these sac uh, sanctified or sacred places in which the Druids assembled? First and most important, they were sacred groves of trees, especially oak trees. The name Druid means knowing the oak tree. It was within these groves that most assemblies and religious ceremonies occurred. The Druids also valued the trees for curative benefits. The mistletoe, seen as a sign from the Celtic other world, their name of a place where afterlife was thought to exist, was used as a cure against poisons, infertility, and even used to cure animals. It can readily be seen that it was here in these sacred groves that the druids dispensed their judgment and punishments. When the people were not nearby, groves uh, were not nearby groves. They assembled by rivers, streams, and lakes. The Celts worshipped water gods and believed water to be sacred. Like trees and water, the Druids held some islands to be sacred too. One is the island of Mona, also called Mon or Anglice. The sanctuary there was destroyed by the Romans in 60 AD. It is thought that both Irish and British Druids periodically assembled in sacred strongholds. The Isle of Man, sacred to the sea god Mananan, appears to have been viewed with similar solemnity. A stone discovered in the 19th century bore a Celtic inscription written in Ogam. Ogam. A cryptic writing used mainly for commemorative inscriptions on wood and stone, which translates the stone of Dova Dona, son of the Druid. This indicates Druids inhabited men as late as the 5th and 6th century AD. Other discoveries and legends also indicate this. There is the discovery of the three sons of the 5th century Irish king Urk, Urk buried on Iona. Iona. This preceded the coming of Saint Columba. It seems that one of the Columba's brethren was sacrificed to build a mon monastery there. This indicates pagan beliefs and ceremonies still existed long after the coming of Christianity. According to Welsh legend, such human sacrifices were recommended and performed during the building of Vortigern's castle. Vortigern. The construction was delayed because as soon as a stone was laid, it disappeared. The druids ordered a child born without a father be sacrificed and its blood sprinkled on the site to cleanse it. Okay. 
There are several descriptions of Druidic human sacrifices. They were performed within a religious and spiritual sense. Many were performed publicly among the Celtic people, especially at the celebration of Beltane. They there were also private human sacrifices. If a leader of, of warriors was defeated in battle, in disgrace, he would often turn his sword upon himself. The reverse was also true. A petition to the gods was sometimes accompanied by self-sacrifice. Behind druidical performance of human sacrifice lied the druidic belief in an afterlife. Again, Caesar em empathically states it. Doctrinally, the most important druid belief was that after death the soul passes from one to another, hence the Celts' bravery in battle. This belief is reincarnation. Uh, in reincarnation was not just in the transmigration of the soul from one human form to another, but to other life forms as well. This is evident in the Irish epic Tain Bo Tain Bo the cattle raid of Cooley. In it, two magical bulls processing human reasoning, initially originating as two swineherds of the lord of the other world, pass through a long series of metamorphoses. They become ravens, stages, warriors, water monsters, demons, and aquatic worms. Okay. The evidence from archaeology, the classic writings and vernacular tradition to the present reinforces Caesar's assertion, assertion. In tombs have been found remains of lavish amounts of food, hearty meat, equipment that would seem to indicate the belief the soul would need these thing things in the other world. In the poet Lucan's Parsalia, Parsalia, a verse epic about the Roman Civil War, he addresses the Druids with, If we understand you right, death is only a pause in a long life. The writer Posidonius states that Celtic men were willing to have their throats cut so they could follow their prince into death and then into a new life. A similar interpretation might be drawn from the sacrifice scene on the Gundestrup cauldron. One column of warriors are marching into uh, to the sacrifice while another reborn are marching away from it. An explanation for this might be the Celts compared men to sacrificial vessels in which human life was offered up in exchange for another existence. It is known that the wheel was a Celtic symbol of rebirth. The wheel appears on sword sheaths and other pieces of art. That the Celts did not fear death was not because they had a low regard for life or a feeling of recklessness in battle, but it arose from generations of druid teachings. Such teaching were taught by druids for countless generations, having been recited at grave sites. Many seasonal assemblies were held at burial sites, including the enigmatic passage graves, dolmens of the megaliths that stud Ireland. From these beliefs came the interweaving of the spiritual and mundane worlds until the two could hardly be separated. Such an attitude or viewpoint is a blending of ancient Celtic and proto-Celtic ideals which formed the essential and archaic nature of Druidism. The Druids were said to be the keepers of traditional wisdom which was concerned with moral philosophy, natural phenomena and theology. They were skilled in the reading of omens, the interpretation of dreams, the conducting of sacrifices, the construction of a calendar, herbal medicine, astronomy, and the composition of poetry. Some say they also practiced 
sexual magic. One way the druids read a romance was by killing a victim. The inhabitants employ a very surprising and incredible custom when they want to know matters of great importance. They consecrate a human being to death, drive a dagger into his belly above the abdomen, and draw conclusions about events to come from the squirming of the victim and the squirting of his blood. They have been practicing this since time immemorial. The composing, composing of poems was the chief duty of the bard, who was also considered a priest in Druidism. In most, if not all, battles, bards went along not to fight but to record the battle, which they later composed into verse, to be sung and read to the people of their tribe or clan. Bards were free to move about in battle without being in danger because it was a strict rule of druidic law that no bard should be killed. Bards, like other priests and priestesses, were considered to be gifted for their offices. Some were also seers. Ammianus, a Roman historian, said Druids are uplifted by searchings into things most secret and sublime. Much attention has been drawn to the Druid human sacrificial ceremonies, which usually conducted on the festive days. Pliny recorded that the slaying of a human being was considered a highly religious act, acts among the Britons, and the seating of the flesh regarded as a wholesome remedy. Also, the Roman historian Diodorus Siculus states the Irish ate their enemies, and the Greek historian and traveler Pausanias tells how the Galatian Celts ate the flesh and drank the blood of children. The Irish Celts also are said to have washed their faces in the blood of the slain, and Im uh, imbibed in it. They drank the blood of dead relatives, a custom that existed until the 16th century. In the Western Isles, the Blood Brotherhood survived until recent times. All of these cultural traditions certainly point to a Druidic influence. Why was such influence so strong and prevalent, it might be asked? Caesar gave two reasons. Druids were omitted from military service and did not have to pay taxes. These appear to be mundane reasons when Caesar also noted some Druids studied as long as 20 years. The Druids, as it had been noted, seemed to possess gifts for learning and art. Their concern for moral philosophy made them skillful judges in rendering rewards and punishments. Their priestly duties also enhanced their judgments as they knew how to conduct the proper ceremonies to the gods. There were also female druids because women were important in the Celtic culture. Hmm. There were many gods and goddesses. Celtic pantheon. The Celtic belief in the gods was known by their personal names that rendered three kinds of information about an individual. This information was the person's own name, his identity, his collective name. The classics stated that the Celts knew themselves by the name of Keltoi or Keltai, and his ancestral name, which would in the early period of these people indicate which pagan god from which he was descended. Caesar said that the Gauls all assert their descent from Dispater and that is that it is the Druidic belief. Three other major gods were Teutates, god of the people, he possessed qualities of both the Roman gods Mars and Mercury, in that he was not just a god of war, but of healing, fertility and protection. 
guarding the people against disease and hostility. Though he was guardian of the people, he required his victims to be drowned in sacred wells of, or pools, which figured strongly among the Celts. In such receptacles, receptacles, what receptacles were often offered expensive weapons and ornaments to the gods. Essus was not a very popular god, and little wonder, since he required his victims to be hung or stabbed. There are few inscriptions to him, although he was called Lord and Master. Tarrhenus, known as Thunder, is equal to Jupiter. He was symbolized by the wheel, which was either of lightning or a solar symbol, and less frequently the spiral representing a lightning flash. He requires prisoners of war to be burned in wicker cages. These three gods lead the Celtic large and complex pantheon and played important roles in, in sacrificial worship ceremonies. Each, it was believed, had given explicit instructions known to druid priests as to how their victims were to be sacrificed. The most notable were the sacrifice offered to Tyrannus, which was the sacrificing of prisoners. Both the Greek biographer Diodorus Skoulos and geographer Strabo described the sacrifice. They set up a colossus of wood and straw. It must have been something like a gigantic basket-like plated figure. Shut cattle, wild animals and human beings in it and set light to the whole thing. This ceremony was usually held at the Feast of Beltin and was referred to by Caesar. Fires played an important role at Beltin and Saint-Main because of the threat of poor crops and a harsh winter. Diodorus thought the human beings were slain first by a blow to the head, but the writers agreed that the victims, however killed, were not sacrificed so much as a cruelty but for the sake of religiosity. Others have written that before their deaths the victims were told what to ask the gods for when reaching the other world. This again reinforces the Celtic belief in an afterlife. All agreed the druids, or wise men, officiated at these rituals. The Roman Senate, by degree, outlawed such human sacrifices. A sacrifice in uh, uh, 97 BC, it was called a barbaric practice. This, of course, was before the Christians, lions or gladiators uh, in the arena. Celtic warriors were known to be fierce fighters. Caesar laid, laid this on the fact of their druidic belief in life after death. This not fearing death made them braver. They were well trained and skilled in warfare. Through this, they acquired the name of Headhunters. It was described that Celtic warriors were seen with whole wreaths of victims' heads dangling from their bridles. bridles. There is also literature, literature hinting of homosexuality among the warriors. One writer, Do Drodorus, says Celtic women were not only as tall as the men, but as courageous as well, but despite of their charm, the young men paid little attention to them. They longed instead for the embrace of one of their own sex, lying on animal skins and tumbling around with a lover on either side. It is particularly surprising they attached no value to their dignity or decency, offering their bodies to each other without further ado. This was not regarded as at all harmful. On the contrary, if they were rejected in their approaches, they felt insulted. Such behavior was regarded to be the result of their training. Celtic children were allowed to play what they 
what were called sex games, so they would be familiar with each other, but others' bodies when mating. As soon as young men were old enough to bear arms, they lived solely, solely among men. They trained exclusively with men. Therefore, it was thought natural they should form a likeness for each other. It was not hard in such a situation to see how latent homoeroticism could turn into true homosexuality. Constant companionships developed such bonds as a driver would a uh, driver for his passion passenger or a spare carrier for the warrior. Examples of this were Achilles loved Patro Patroclus as did Alexander the Great Hephaestion. Wherever there was no taboo, such relationships understandably gave rise to a cult of the male body. It is also stated that women that bore children were greatly respected and won a high social status. In time of war, they were extremely courageous and fought beside of their men. By ancient druidic law, a man was permitted to have two wives. When thinking of Celtic women, the name of Brigitte must be mentioned. There are many legends concerning her, so it is difficult to say whether there was a real woman by such a name, owning up to all the things attributed to her, or she was just a Celtic goddess. According to Celtic mytholo mythology, the Irish Brigitte is the equivalent to the Gaulish goddess Minerva. Caesar included Minerva among the major deities of Gaul. Both were patronesses of poetry, learning, healing, and art, or craftsmanship. Later, the Christian church made her Saint Brigitte, but her pagan past survived. Her feast day is February the 1st, which directly coinci coincides to Imbolc, the pagan festival for the celebration of spring. Wenn ich da irgendwas falsch ausspreche, es tut mir so leid. Also, ich will hier niemanden irgendwie verletzen oder so. The two goddesses may be thought of as one only by different names, according to other writings and legends. Brigitte and 19 nuns guarded a perpetually burning sacred fire surrounded by a hedge within, uh, within which no male could enter. Minerva's sanctuary is Britain, also was supposed to have contained a perpetual burning fire. There is doubt whether the pagan Brigitte and Saint Brigitte or Saint Bridget were one and the same. Therefore, there is speculation that the Celtic Irish Brigitte, uh, Brigitte was one abbotess of a pagan sanctuary which later became Brigitte's monastery near Kildare. It was at such sanctuaries that men and women studied together. There were also sanctuaries at, or schools for women who became druid priestesses. This has important historical significance because during the Dark Ages, when the church was busy hunting heretics, Ireland, being isolated by itself, was left alone. During this time, Ireland built great schools and libraries at which students could study. Many of Europe's nobility sent their sons and daughters to study in Ireland during this period. Such, uh, such institutions date back to Druidic times. The schools for women, especially uh, eventually in Christian times, became schools for the sisterhood or nuns. Also hat die christliche Kirche einfach alles geklaut. Na toll. Sehr kreativ. <lacht> Historically, the Romans just wanted to 
demolished the military and political strength of the Druids and bring them under their control of the Empire. This was pretty well accomplished by the beginning of the 2nd century AD. The Romans, though, were not too concerned about Druidism itself during their earlier conflicts, uh, conflicts with the Celts because Druidism and the Roman religion were both polytheistic, uh, therefore they coexisted together. Even though the Druids lost much of the power, Druidism still lingered on. The ancient and emotional beliefs of a culture are hard to destroy. Such was seen when Christianity became the official religion of Rome. Christianity was monotheistic and most of the emperors soon saw themselves as godheads. There was to be no questioning of their rule or religion. If there was, it amounted to treason. Soon, on the surface, especially in Britain and the Western Isles, the pagan religion seemed to die and enter the Roman temples or churches. But like other pagan religions, Druidism did not completely die within its practitioners. They just observed and hid their old and sacred beliefs while observing Christianity as well. It seems that the Dru uh, Celtic Druidism lingered on into the 20th, the 20th century, although there was evidence of it in the centuries before. An informant of Dr. Anne Ross... Uh, went Anne Ross... A native of Perthshire took her to the sacred square where the rites described by Minister James Robertson James Robertson of the same area were performed. The informant remembered witnessing the rituals as a young girl before the First World War. In her, in her description, a bonfire was lit the oatmeal pancake was made with much care. There was the darkened area resembling the mark of a huge thumb appeared. The cake was then sliced into pieces and placed in a bag. On lookers drew pieces out of the bag. The person drawing the charred slice had to jump through the fires and was then driven from the area with shouts and jeers. He was a kind of what? Scapegoat. The informant said, but in the old days he or she would have been sacrificed. Dr. Ross was told a similar story in Derbyshire in 1977 when she witnessed the lightning of the Beltan fires on May Eve under the pretext of burning rubbish. Traces of Druidism have been discovered throughout the centuries. There has been much romanticizing about the Druids. In the 17th century, John Aubrey, what about John Aubrey, alleged the Druids constructed Stonehenge. Stonehenge. Uh, a theory which has been proven inaccurate. However, in the 18th century, William Stukeley, okay, William Stukeley endorsed Aubrey's views and became the first arch-druid and the founder of modern druidism. Since then, there have been formations and slitting ups of druidic orders. The Druids may not have built Stonehenge, but it has been significant in their history. There is spe speculation that the Druids met near Stonehenge. A half mile south of it is Normanton Down, Wiltshire, one of the finest barrow cemeteries in Britain. It will be remembered. That, uh, it will be remembered the Druids met at burial sites. Other aspects of Stonehenge 
suggest the druids may have used it to construct their Coligny or Bush Barrow calendar. Therefore, it is supposed they would not have used it as a burial ground or matter. The Bush Barrow calendar calendar uh, ties in with the Bush Barrow excavation of 1808. A man of considerable height and social status was discovered under the mound 11 feet high. He was obviously a king or chieftain. Soon on the breast of his garment was a l what lozenge shaped breastplate with an engraved surface. The inscriptions indicate his possible burial was 1900 BC. Before 1915, Stonehenge was privately owned and modern druids met there. With the overturning of a stone in 1900, fees began to be charged. In 1915, the owner Cecil Chubb, Cecil Chubb turned it over to the government. For this, the druids ritually cursed him, but continued meeting there until 1888, eh, 1988, sorry, when their meetings were stopped because of the vandalism by spectators which their meetings attracted. Aww. The modern North American druids have no connection with the ancient or modern British druids. The first group or grove, the Reformed Druids of North America, RDNA, was formed in 1963 at Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota, to protest the school's mandatory student attendance of religious service. When the, blah, 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 blah. When the requirement was dropped, the grove continued not so much as a religious group, but a philosophical one. Rituals was uh, based and discovered anthropological materials, including a non-bloody sacrifice. This group is no longer an active organization, but has independent groves scattered throughout the country. Several groves split off to form a separate branch, this being called the New Reformed Druids of North, North America, NRDNA, which emphasizes neo-pagan religion. One such grove was in Berkeley, California, led by Archdruid P.E.I. Isaac Bone Wits during the 1970s. In 1983, he formed his own organization. Uh, what? Aren't Dreyokt our own druidism? which had about 400 members in 1988. Some have said the spirit of ancient druidism is dead. Others call them headhunters in a derog derogatory sense, but the importance of ancient druidism seems to be that it was the one thing which held the Celtic people together, and these people and their ancestors eventually civilized a major part of Europe, Ireland, Britain, and the British Isles. For this key and their customs, though some were crude, deserve respect and understanding. Several of the details within this article were attained from previously reading two novels by Morgan Llewellyn Bard and Druids. This writer is grateful and recommends these books and others by this author to those interested in reading about the lives of the Druids. Das war lang, aber auch sehr interessant. Cathars. The Cathar movement sprang to life in the south of France. Cathars were dualists. Oh boy. Dualists. They believed that they, uh, there were two powers, those of light and those of darkness. 
unlike the Catholics, they believed the power of darkness to be just as strong as the power of light. For this, they were condemned as heretics and persecuted and eventually wiped out by the Roman popes. The Cathars called the power of darkness Rex Mundi, or King of the World. Rex Mundi was absolute ruler over the earth and all material things, including our bodies. For this reason, the physical body was condemned by the Cathars and all pleasures of the flesh were to be avoided. But within the corrupt material body, the power of light had inserted a bit of its light, the soul. It was the Cathars' highest aim to th strive for unity with that divine, to align oneself with the soul of the spiritual rather than the body or the material. In uh, the image of two triangles overlapping, forming a hexagram shape was a popular symbol for this dualist concept. One triangle was black and represented the power of darkness, and one was white and represented the power of light. Okay. Uh, paganism is a general term which is usually understood as denoting any religious act, practice or ceremony which is not Christian. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's easy. Anyone practicing paganism is usually known as a pagan. The word pagan comes from the Latin word paganus, which means a, a what a country dweller. Ich würde sagen, also wenn ich irgendeiner Sache am ehesten noch was abgewinnen kann, dann ist das irgendwie ähm, Religionen, die mit der Natur sehr stark verbunden sind, also Sachen, die wohl eher ähm, ins Heidentum gehen würden, also Pagan, Paganism wäre das wohl eher. Ja, naturverbundene Religionen finde ich, glaube ich, noch am besten, die im Einklang mit der Natur leben. Aber ich glaube halt nicht daran, dass es irgendwie übernatürliche Wesen gibt. Egal was jetzt, ob das jetzt Adonai ist oder irgendwelche anderen Götter. Manche Leute in so Naturreligionen, die glauben ja auch, dass sie magische Fähigkeiten haben. Auch daran glaube ich nicht. Ich glaube schon, dass die Natur um uns herum, also Mutter Natur selber, dass sie eine gewisse Art von Magie hat. Irgendwie, keine Ahnung, so Good Vibes. Also, dass es da so eine Energie gibt. Also, man ist ja meistens, wenn man in der Natur ist, irgendwie glücklicher oder so. So in dem Sinne, das kann ich schon nachvollziehen. Aber wirklich an Magie und Götter glaube ich nicht. Aber die Naturreligion finde ich halt eigentlich schon, wenn ich mich entscheiden müsste, dann finde ich die am besten. Mm. As Christianity grew, the term pagan took on a different definition and unsavory connotations. Gradually, a pagan referred to anyone not being a Christian, and paganism came to mean a non-Christian belief or religion. The Christian Church has vigorously attempted to eradicate it by implying that pagans are unsophisticated, uneducated, and worship false gods. Yeah, in extremen Leben, sehr schön. <laughs> Present-day pagans, or neo-pagans, as some refer to themselves, find a unison with the ecstatic and mysticism of the pre-Christian religions, which they find missing in the mainstream Western religion. Neo-paganism brings them closer to both nature and the divine forces. Ja, ich würde, wenn dann nur Natur, die divine forces interessieren mich nicht. The Christian God seems remote or alienated to them, and they see most Christians as, as viewing nature uh, as just something to be exploited. Most pagans and neo-pagans view paganism as a religion chiefly worshipping the mother goddess, God, and nature. The religion also is polytheistic, having many deities in the pantheon, 
To some, these goddesses and gods are more than just deities. They represent archetypes of the collective unconsciousness. Ja, wahrscheinlich the mother, the maiden, the child, or uh, something like that. Goddess and witchcraft. Within this section. Okay, da muss ich nochmal noch neu aufschreiben. Witchcraft is a other category. Okay, then. Sai. A designation for both extrasensory pers- Ach du meine Güte. Uh, paranormal? Ach du heilige. Okay. What the? A designation for both extrasensory perception, ESP, and psychokinesis, PKK, as proposed in 1946 by the British psychologist Dr. Robert Towles and W.P. Weissner. The reasons for the proposal were that Psi is the 23rd letter of the Greek alphabet commonly used in parapsychology to include both phenomena of ESP and PK because both are closely related. However, since that time, the term often has been inaccurately used to include almost any paranormal experience or phenomenon. Discarded theories. Theories concerning the functioning of Psi have been difficult to formulate because it defies most laboratory experiments to describe it activity in physical or quasi-physical terms. It operates outside of the boundaries of time and space. No physical variables influence psi in laboratory testing. Theories that psi is some sort of wave, particle, force or field have been advanced and discarded. Psi is not nor is it affected by the four forces of physics strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, gravitational force or electromagnetic force. It is not subject either to the law of thermodynamics or the law of gravity. Psi requires no exchange of energy, which is pretty remarkable in incidents of apparent PK. For example, according to the mechanical laws of physics, the dematerialization of a copper penny would require the energy of a small nuclear bomb. Psi defies the theory of relativity which states that no particle or object can move faster than the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second. All such Psi defiance to be defined in physical terms has forced researchers to look elsewhere for explanations. Some occultists believe Psi is a vibration manifested throughout the world, but most scientists view this possibility with skepticism. Uh, physiological, physiological effects since it is almost impossible to identify psi throughout laboratory experimentation, one way that has been found to identify it is through the measurement of the involuntary psychological processes in the autonomic nervous system of laboratory test subjects. The most common measures are the Calvanic skin response, GSR which records the activity of the sweat gland and the plethysmograph, which measures the changes in blood volume in the finger that are caused by the dilation of uh, and constriction of blood vessels. Less often used is the electroencephalograph, EEG, which measures brain activity. The GSR and 
plethysmograph are used to detect emotional arousal. Their use in psi tests indicate when the subject is confronted with emotional charged targets as opposed to emotionally neutral targets. Autonomic activity increases when information that is emotionally emotionally charged for the per participant appears to be conveyed psych psyche psy what the psychically psychically studies with Gans field stimulation show that an alpha state of brain wave appears to be conductive to psi psi performance improves with the positive mood and accept expectation is provided by the experiment in a friendly atmosphere. Psi decreases when the experimenter sets up conditions for anxiety and negative mood, expectations, boredom and a hostile environment. Okay. Paranormal. Oh my god. Oh god, oh god. Okay. Para nor normal. Das ist so viel. Das ist ja eine Lebensaufgabe hier mit dem Ding. Okay, da habe ich Punkte bekommen. Pythagoras. A Greek philosopher of 6th century BC who founded a school and a philosophical philosophical system. Pythagore Pythagoreanism named after him. Born on the Greek island of Samos, off of the coast of Asia Minor, he migrated as an adult to the Greek city-state of Croton. Croton, in southern Italy, about 530 BC. As a teacher and leader, Pythagoras possessed extraordinary charisma. In Croton, he established a society or brotherhood of religious ethical orientation. Within its in it initiates, the society fostered strong bonds of friendship and a feeling of elit elitism through a ritual, esoteric symbolism, and a code of righteous self control that included taboos. The basis of his teaching was ethical, religious, and mystical. He believed in met metempsycho metempsychosis, the concept that the soul, both human and animal, passes from one body to another body. It is uncertain whether metempsychosis included the belief in the immortality of the soul. Or not. However, the concept provided the rational for many of the practices within the so his society, which included vegetarianism and rituals of purification, which were thought to promote superior reincarnation. To the alchemist alchemists, Pythagoras is regarded as the father of mathematical mysticism a role which scholars debate and several key doctrines such as the squaring of the circle are attributed to him the image below is an example of pythagorean geometry oh okay squaring the circle so alexander pd oh, okay cool the lot of a stone originally the philosopher's stone was believed to be the chemical that changed base metals into silver or gold. Often it was termed the power of projection. It was first mentioned by Zosimos the Theban in the 3rd century. Throughout the generations the Philosopher's Stone has taken on an immense range of powers. Not only has it been called the secret of life and health, but also possessing spiritual significance. 
The no notion of its spiritual qualities expanded until, in the 13th century, a program evolved that led the uh, alchemist through a strict devotional ritual and purification. After completing this ceremony, he was thought worthy to perform his activities. Eventually, the Philosopher's Stone was thought to signify the force behind the evolution of life and the universal binding power which unites minds and souls in a human oneness. Finally, it represented the purity and sanctity of the highest realm of pure thought and altruistic existence. Oh, wow. Okay. Hexagram, six-pointed star. This symbol has had many meanings over the centuries. In the Gnostic tradition, it represented duality and was usually shown as one wide upward-pointed triangle superimposed by one dark downward pointed triangle. In other words, the uh, like the Chinese Tao, it was a symbol of the equality or duality of light and dark, spiritual and matter. It was later adopted by the Rosicrucians and became their symbol of for man's nature or the soul, whereas the pentagram is normally associated with Satanism the hexagram is associated with spirit. The six-pointed star is also the seal of Solomon. Seal of Solomon. And as such has become the symbol of the Jewish faith. The seal of Solomon is the star of Bethlehem. Was a bright star appeared over the city of Bethlehem at the time of Jesus' birth. It was believed to be an omen of divine or sacred nativity at Magi or wise men. From distant realms, some say Persia followed the star the birthplace of the infant. Sacred bloodline of the pharaohs. In ancient Egypt, the bloodline of the pharaohs was manipulated in each successive generation by a powerful sect of priests. The blood of the pharaohs was considered divine due to this calculated genetic cross-matching. In their efforts, the priests used a variety of methods to determine the proper marriages, marriages including magical portents and divination, astrological progression and even a kind of ritual that would now be considered a form of chemical testing. The bloodline was intermarried frequently brother to sister to double its divine potency the priests were trying to create a living osiris a god on earth by perfecting the lineage of the pharaohs the details of this process were one of the highest secrets of egypt and have been lost to the sands of time sounds aber schön geschrieben the sands of time <laughs> 